Hi, fifth and sixth grade. It's Mrs. Partipillo again. I'm here ready for another great lesson in music today, and I hope you're ready too. To get started, you are going to need this packet handout. I gave it to you this week in your envelopes. We're going to go through it quickly. Most of it should be a review for you from music and from band, but some of it might be a little bit new and you might need a little bit of a reminder. So I thought we'd go through this quickly. And then uh, the back is more of that same information we'll be going through here. This page is what you're going to be asked to do on your own and then turn into me, okay? So let's start today. The front of the packet reviews dynamics, okay? So right over here on the board, I've got these dynamics. I'd like us to just quickly review what dynamics are for one, and two, when you see these, what does that mean, okay? So first, dynamics is the level or the volume you hear in the music. So you either hear a little bit of sound or you hear a lot of sound. And these different dynamics tell us what to do when we're playing our musical instruments or singing. So let's go ahead and read pianissimo, remember, very soft. Piano, soft, mezzo piano, medium soft, mezzo forte, medium loud, forte, pretty strong, and fortissimo, very loud. Okay, so that's the dynamics that you need to review with the sheet here. And then down here we've got dynamics that change, right? They don't stay the same. A crescendo starts soft and it gradually gets louder. That's why we have the short point showing small dynamics getting bigger. It's not a sudden change, it's gradual. And that's kind of hard sometimes when we're playing. A day crescendo starts loud and gradually gets softer as we go. Okay, so that's all of the dynamics that I wanted us to review. Here's articulation. Articulation is a way in which a note is played. So if you were asked to play this note on your instrument, and it has a little tiny dot underneath of it, some of you have done this before. It's staccato, short and crisp notes. Duh. Really strong attack with your tongue if you're playing it on your band instrument. This note has the little tiny arrow underneath of it. And uh, if the stem is going down, like this stem right here, if it's going down on your note, the arrow will be above. So that's where you have to take a look for that accent. Accent means to give the note a little bit of extra emphasis. That way it maybe it's a little stronger and it stands out. These symbols, sforzando, you'll either see SF or you'll see the SFZ. It stands for this word, sforzando. And that means you give it a nice forceful attack, but then you back off real quick too. So it's kind of like this. Cool effect, it really is cool. And you can't actually do it on piano very well because the sforzando is meant to be loud and then you back off often, okay? So this tenuto note here has a little line underneath of it and that means you're going to hold the note a little bit extra. It's another way to give that note some emphasis and make it stand out compared to others. Here's a note that is to be held. Remember we call that the bird's eye or the fermata. And if the conductor was holding your note, you would wait for the conductor to end your note there with the fermata. And going on to the last section of that packet that we are going to review. Tempo is the rate of speed in music. So we, just like when you're doing things with your body, if you're walking or you're running, or maybe you're standing still or you're sprinting. Those are all different speeds, right? Well, music is the same way. We have different speeds and the words here are different tempos telling us what speed to go or rate of speed in our music. So largo is very slow. Adagio is slow. Andante is a a getting a little faster, possibly walking, if you can think of it that way. Moderato, a moderate speed, a good walking tempo. Allegro is fast, but not as fast as some others, right? We've got Presto, that's even a little faster. And then Vivace, 
that's a cool word, right? Vivace is really fast, okay? So all of these words tell us how fast or slow the music goes. These two words are tempos that change. So a ritardando, ritardando means to gradually slow down. We often see ritardandos at the end of a song, don't we? And then accelerandos are uh, speeding up. I've explained it this way. You think about the gas pedal in your car. When you push on the gas pedal, you accelerate, you go faster, don't you? Well, an accelerando is the same thing in music. You just go gradually faster. It's not a sudden thing, either one of these. It's gradual, so we have to be careful to do that too. Well, we've reviewed all of this information, dynamics, articulations, and then on the back here was the tempos. You have some questions to answer. Now, before you get started though, I need to explain this section right here for number two. Some of you might be a little confused as to what you're supposed to do. I will read it and explain it to you. Number two says, use one of these dynamic signs at least once to mark the appropriate dynamic signs on the lines beneath the following story. Here are the signs or dynamics to use. Pianissimo, piano, mezzo piano, mezzo forte, forte, fortissimo, crescendo and diminuendo. Diminuendo is another word for decrescendo. It means getting soft, okay? Gradually getting softer. So here's the story and I'll explain. Wake up, whispered Ron to his brother Stephen. Well, underneath the word whispered is A and a line. Which one of these dynamics would describe whispering? Well, whispering is pretty soft, isn't it? I would put either pianissimo or piano because it's a very soft dynamic. So that's what you would need to put it A. I'm going to keep reading the story and help you with one more. The boys walked softly out the door. So softly, how would you describe softly in dynamics? Probably piano, right? Or pianissimo. It's not a very loud thing to do. So that's what you need to do. All of these letters here in this paragraph need some dynamic to describe what's going on in the story. I think that makes sense. The rest of it is not very difficult. And of course, you can always call me and ask me with questions. I know Amelia called me this week asking for help with an assignment. Good job, Amelia. She was looking for a little bit of help on a crossword puzzle. I am very happy to take your phone call and help you. I'm always an email away also. Please take time to do that. I don't want you to miss out on great work that you could be learning. Take time if you're not sure what to do to ask me for help, okay? <clears throat> the next thing we're going to do fifth and sixth grade is we're going to sing the song, This Joyful Easter Time. I gave it to you last week. Hopefully you haven't lost it. This joyful Easter tide is our hymn of the month and we were going to be singing it in chapel and I'm hoping most of you are missing chapel. You're missing all the fun singing we get to do at Trinity. Well, let's take our time to do that now. Get this hymn out. We're going to work on stanza one and stanza two today. Let's review stanza one to start. Of course, pause the video if you need to to get these words because I'd imagine most of you don't quite have it memorized, right? Verse 1. This joyful Easter tide, away with sin and sorrow, my love, the crucified, has sprung to life this morrow. Refrain. Had Christ who once was slain not burst his three-day prison, our faith had been in vain. But now has Christ arisen, 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 but no. Beautiful fifth 
fifth and sixth grade. Let's go on to verse two. Just read the words with me first. Death's flood has lost its chill since Jesus crossed the river. Lover of souls from ill, my passing soul deliver. Had Christ who once was slain not burst his three-day prison, our faith had been in vain. But now has Christ arisen, arisen, arisen. But now has Christ arisen. Verse 2, here we go. Death's blood has lost its chill since Jesus crossed the singing fifth and sixth grade. Don't lose that page. We have one more verse to work on next week. We're going to go ahead and go on with more music styles. Remember this page? Music style dictionary and we learned about the minuet, the waltz, and the polka last week. I hope some of you took time and you looked at this page for help from me. And I listed all of the different music types and some examples for you to go and listen to on your own. Please tell me some of you have done that because some of these styles are so fun to learn about and to listen to. And I really think you'd enjoy watching some of these videos. Some of the music is definitely not music you would listen to on your own, I have no doubt. Well, we are starting today by learning about the march which is at the bottom of that first page, that style dictionary. And then we're going to flip and we're going to be doing the ragtime and the blues. Okay, those are the three types of music we're gonna be learning about today. And as I just said, here's the examples that you can go to on your own to listen to. And I know some of you would really like that. So learning about the march, right here at the bottom. I will go ahead and read, and then I do have a few examples to play for you myself, too. So the march is, march music is a form of classical music originally written for and performed by military bands. History finds armies marching to music, even played by just a single drum, flute, or bagpipe. Maybe you've heard about that in wars. Oftentimes there's one bugle, or there's one drum that everyone stays in step with in the army. Continuing on, to maintain their spirits and morale, the march's strong beat and energetic rhythms soon became a popular style for solo piano and instrumental works as well. Earlier marches, like those of Beethoven, Mozart, and Handel, tended to be part of a symphony or suite. The greatest composer and conductor of march music is probably John Philip Sousa. And some of you in Immediate Band, remember we're playing The Thunder right now, that number 70 in the Intermediate book? That's by John Philip Sousa, isn't it? He played, or he created a large amount of marches. He's even known as the March King himself. Going on to the back, we have Ragtime and Blues. But before we go on, Here's the examples of marches that I have to play for you today. The first one is a march by uh, Franz Schubert. Maybe you remember Franz Schubert? His nickname was Tubby. He was from the uh, classical period. He was one of the four big composers from the classical period. And he wrote the Erl Koenig. He also wrote um, uh, the Trout. He in the, developed the art song. He was a very good composer. He did not live very long. I think he was in his 30s when he passed away. But one of the best composers out there for the classical period. 
Here's Franz Schubert's Milch, uh, March Militaire. at the same time. That was actually, that was pretty hard. <laughs> Going on, Funeral March of the Marionette by a man named Charles Genode. I'm guessing his last name is French. I'm not too familiar with him, but this march is a little slower and a funeral march. Let's think about that. What do you think it was used for? Probably when there was a funeral, the casket and the family would march through town to go to the seminary. That would be my guess as to why this is called Funeral March of the Marionette. are highly rhythmic and playful pieces, especially popular in the United States from around 1895 to 1915. Their name comes from ragged time, often simply called rags. The melodies are syncopated with accents on the off beats accompanied by the tick-tock evenness of the accompaniment. Rags were either played by piano or by small bands and became an early influence of jazz pieces. The best known composer of rags is Scott Joplin. We're actually going to listen to a piece right now by Scott Joplin called The Entertainer. Before I play the parts together though, I'm going to play just the left hand so you can hear what's called stride piano. Stride piano was often popular in ragtime and it involved one low note, followed by a cluster of notes on the second and fourth beats like this. One, two, three, four, two. See how it's one note group, one note group. That's called stride piano. It was very popular in ragtime. Scott Joplin's entertainer has the right hand playing all the melody. Did you hear the syncopation? Four and one and and three, four and. Yeah, one and and three, four and. That's all syncopation right there. Okay, here is Scott Joplin's The Entertainer. Another example of a rag uh, by a lady named Janet Vogt, and she wrote the bumblebee rag. So it should sound like a bumblebee flying around. Yeah, fun, 
wasn't it? So rag times, if you look at your example of what to listen to, you've got two pieces to listen to by Scott Joplin, the entertainer and then the maple leaf rag, okay? All right, let's go on to the blues. The blues. A rich heritage and history lies behind the blues. It first began in African American music in the rural South in the late 19th century, characterized by a 12 bar, or that means 12 measures long, construction and melancholy lyrics. In the 1920s and 1930s, the rural or Delta blues were performed often on guitar or harmonica. In the 1940s and 1950s, it took on urban sounds using electric instruments, captured especially by musicians in Chicago. In the 1960s, it grew in even greater popularity with music performed by B.B. King, inspiring British musician Eric Clapton. So the blues is, uh, we've played a little bit of the blues. Perhaps some of you remember the report card blues earlier in our band book. They're 12 measures long and it just repeats itself and things can change. So the first 12 bars or 12 measures is played one way and then the second it's played a different way and the pattern keeps going and going until the end of the song. With these two examples of the blues, we have a medium tempo, they're not fast, and with both of them they're really laid back and you'll hear what's called swing. So instead of playing notes like this, one and two and three and four and, they're laid back and they have a little bit of a swing feel like this. One, a two, a three, a four, a one, a two, a three. Instead of da, 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 like a robot, it's very laid back, okay? So let me play it once, robot style, one and two and three, and then you'll hear the swing, the laid back setting. straightforward like I told you the robot. Here's the laid back swing style. One and two and one a two a three and four and hear the difference? Yeah it just automatically feels like blues or jazz music when you do it that way doesn't it? Okay I'm going to play the whole example this is called turquoise blues. called the Too Bad Blues. Examples I listed here on your packet to go visit online is a piece by the Glenn Miller Orchestra called In the Mood. And that piece was the first dance Mr. Partipil and I danced at our wedding. It's a really fun jazz piece. Please go take a listen to it. And then Duke Ellington's Sea Jam Blues. And both of these videos are performances by jazz bands playing these pieces and it's really fun to watch. I hope you take time to do that. Okay, the last thing we're going to finish with today is part of a story that I have for you. I'm actually going to read it to you. It's called Do Re Mi. If you can read music, thank Guido de Arezi. And this story tells the history of how um, this man Guido 
wrote a system for how we can read music today. If he had not invented a system, somebody else would have probably, and it might be very different. Do you notice how um, it has on the front page the treble clef and, a, and the staff? Well, that had to have been invented by somebody, right? It didn't just come along. And so we're hearing a little bit of the history of how music was all just done, done by rote. In other words, you had to learn it by memorizing it, hearing it. There was no written way to learn music until someone came along. So let's hear the story. We'll start it today and I'll finish it next week because it's actually quite a long story. A thousand years ago, if you heard a song and wanted to hear it again, you would have to remember it by heart. If you forgot the song, it could be lost forever. A thousand years ago, no one could write down even a single note of music. There were no notes, there were no staves, no clefts, no sharps, no flats. There was no written music at all. A thousand years ago, in a small city in Tuscany, Guido of Arezzo learned to sing by rote, like all the children in the choir. The choir master sang a song, and the children repeated the song they heard. When someone needed a reminder, the choir master had to sing the song all over again. There was no way to read the sounds of a song, like words in a book, because only the words of a song could be written. Words alone are not enough to keep a song alive forever. The thought of writing down the sounds of a song slipped into Guido's head when he was still young. Others had tried to do this before, but no one had ever found a way. The thought stayed with Guido as he grew into a man. Sometimes Guido tried to explain how easy it would be to learn to sing if only music could be read instead of memorized. What's wrong with memorizing? asked Guido's teacher. This is the way my father taught us to sing. Maybe it's not the only way, said Guido. Nonsense, said Guido's teacher. All day long I teach children to memorize their songs. What would I do all day if children could learn songs without me? Everything would change. The musicians of Arezzo were not ready for change, but Guido was ready. He said goodbye to his friends and went to live with the Benedictine monks in Pomposa. Again, Guido tried to explain how easy it would be if only music could be read like words in a book. We already know how to sing, said the monks in Pomposa. We love our music the way it is. Brother Michael stood right next to Guido. He was the only monk who was really listening. So I could make up a song and write it down, he said, and you could read it and sing it before you hear it? It would be like a book. Anyone could sing it if the music could be written. Think of that. Exactly, said Guido. The choir masters won't have anything to do anymore, said Brother Michael. They'll have different things to do, said Guido. Guido began to write on parchment with his quill and ink even before his thoughts were clear. Sometimes he tried to explain what he had written to Brother Michael. Brother Michael praised Guido when what he saw was clear. He complained to Guido when what he saw was not. Guido collected more letters and numbers and symbols than he knew how to use. His collections filled his room. His collecting filled his years. How, but how could he put them together? What should be included? What should be left out? Guido thought about writing down the sounds of songs during his lunches and vespers, his late nights, his walks in the woods. He thought during homilies and lessons. He thought while planting in the garden, comforting the sick, mending the monks' robes. Even when he was busy teaching children to sing, and even when he himself was singing, Guido was always thinking about a written language for music. Bit by bit, Guido began to teach or build his musical system. 
But how could he put all the pieces together in a way that someone else would ever be able to understand? Guido shut his eyes and held his head. You almost have it now, said Brother Michael. No, I don't, said Guido. He pounded his head on the table, or his hand on the table. He put his head down and started to cry. I just can't do it, he said. Guido, said Brother Michael, every day you get a little closer to the answer. You can't give up now. And then Guido had his epiphany. Guido organized his thoughts onto fresh parchments. Brother Michael was the first to see. Thank you for having faith in me, said Guido. I only listened while you worked, said Brother Michael. Soon everyone will listen too. But the other monks in Pomposa still were not ready to learn. We like the way we sing our songs, said the other monks. If you want to write, write a story. If you want to read, read a book. If you want to sing, sing the way you were taught. Leave us alone, Guido. Maybe it's time for you to go home. And so Guido decided to go back to his first home, back to Arezzo. I'll write you letters, said Brother Michael. I'll send you songs, said Guido. Guido sang his way back to Arezzo. Guido's back, said his old friends. Everyone had missed him. Welcome home, Guido, said Teodaldo, the new bishop. Teodaldo asked Guido to become master of the children's choir. I'll do it, said Guido, and I'll teach the children to read music. They will prove to everyone that it is possible. Say that again, said Teopaldo. What in the world are you talking about? Look, said Guido. He held out his hand. Pretend my fingers are lines. Don't look at my thumb. What do you see in between my fingers? Nothing but empty spaces said Teodaldo. Right, said Guido. There are lines and spaces. Pitches go in order from low to high. Each pitch has its place, either on a line or in a space. These are the pieces of the puzzle. Go on, said Teodaldo. Everyone was listening now. Go on, said the others. They had begun to understand at last. Guido took a parchment out of his bag. Here is a song you cannot know, he said, because I composed it. I've written it down. No one has ever seen it or heard it, except for the words, which come from an old poem. Remember that each line and each space has its own pitch. All right, let me hear all of you sing it together. Teodaldo and the others read Guido's music. They sang his song. Bravo, said Guido. Bravo, Guido, they said. Guido did teach the children in his choir to read music. Soon all the world was listening. When the Pope learned how to read music, he invited Guido to move to Rome. Guido was pleased to visit, but even the Pope couldn't persuade him to move away from home again. I am Guido of Arezzo, said Guido di Arezzo. And a thousand years later, this is how he is still known. And that's the end. Here's a little note about the book. Guido's systems, uh, system of lines and spaces developed into the same system for musical notation that we use today. Guido chose the do, that's the bass or the first note of the scale, originally ut, re, mi, fa, so, la, syllables from parts of the poem he set to music a thousand years ago. It is because of Guido de Arezzo that we can hear Gregorian chant the music of Bach, Beethoven, the blues, and all the other music ever written. The end. Isn't that a neat story? I bet you really enjoyed it. I personally really didn't know about him either until I read this book. Well, we did make it through the whole book, and next week uh, we're going to be doing more with music styles. I hope you have a great time doing your music homework, and I look forward to seeing it turned in. Thanks, and I'll see you next week. Bye, fifth and sixth grade.